Uh, welcome to this uh, fantastic uh, venue, very apt, I think. And thank you all to come into the launch event of our new uh, latest research, which hopefully you have a copy in front of you, which is called Gear Shift International Lessons for Increasing Public Transport Ridership in UK Cities. And a very big thank you at the beginning uh, to Go Ahead for working with us and sponsoring this uh, particular uh, project. Uh, in a moment, we're going to hear from my colleague Paul Swinney about the report and the findings in it, just to give you a, a flavour of what we did and what we found and what we think about what we've um, found. But before I do that, I'm going to introduce Go Ahead Group's Chief Executive, Miguel Angel Paras, to say a few words of welcome himself. So, Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Miguel Barras, uh, CEO of the OAHEAD Group. Um, I'm proud to, that we are supporting today's event and sponsoring this thought-provoking report by the Center for Cities. We are grateful to the London Transport Museum for hosting us this morning. It's fantastic to be surrounded in this building by so much transport heritage and expertise. A little about Go Ahead. We are a British public transport company operating bus and rail networks in six countries. Here in the UK, we are best known as the owners of Govia Thameslink Railway, as London's biggest bus operator. We run a quarter of London's buses. We also own regional bus companies stretching from Cornwall up to Northern Berlin. I share a vision with many of you today in this room of cities with comprehensive, reliable, easy to use, environmentally friendly public transport. If we are ever going to tackle climate change, then people to travel by bus, train, and light rail will be crucial. Today's report is packed with insights and good ideas on how we can boost public transport usage. Thank you to the Center for Cities for putting it together. And I'm looking forward to a good discussion this morning. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Miguel. So, the way we're going to do it, um, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, we're going to hear from my colleague, uh, Paul, as I said, who's going to take us through some of the headlines from the report. And then we have a panel that will join me on the stage and we'll have a bit of a conversation about their reflections on this debate, where we are, and more particularly, what we might want to do in order to improve the situation that we find ourselves in. So that's how we run, and we'll be done by... Um, by 10 uh, 30. So without further ado, uh, Paul Swinney, Director of Policy Research, take us through the report. Marvellous, thank you very much Andrew and uh, good morning everybody. Yes, it feels like when we've been in this room that we're actually going to see you know, a film from the 1920s of what the buses were like in London or something like that, one of those captivating films you, you get. And said I'm not going to do that, I'm going to present you on our report. I promise you it's almost as good as one of those films, but you can give me uh, feedback at the end. Um, I've also got a bit of a tendency of talking a bit too quickly, so if I am, please peer at the back, pretend you're trying to flag down a bus, and just say slow down a little bit, and I'll go like, okay, I'll, I'll take a breath for uh, a, a second. So, uh, what have we done? Well, we've, we've put together the report where we've, uh, we've looked at the challenges that we face in terms of UK transport, and we then looked across the world for a number of different case studies to try and provide policy inspiration about what we might do about it, and then come up with policy recommendations at the end about what should happen um, in, uh, in the UK, and in large UK cities in particular. So what is the challenge? And I think this chart really sums up uh, what, that, what that challenge is. And so it puts together, or fits, um, or contrasts, shall I say, uh, large cities in the UK against their international or European counterparts um, in terms of where we could get their data. So cities like, uh, like Munich, Berlin, Zurich, uh, Cologne, Lyon, etc., etc. And there's a very interesting thing that comes out from this chart in that there's one dark green bar right to the, to the left-hand side as you look, which is London, public transport ridership. In London, in terms of commuting, very high, about 50% of all people in London use public transport to get to work. But as you can see, almost all of the other dark green bars for the other large cities in the UK are right down at the other end of the spectrum. Large cities in the UK lag well behind other large cities elsewhere in Western Europe in terms of how many people are using public transport. To suggest there's a bit of an issue there, that it is possible to have higher ridership, and yet we're not doing it here. Now, 
quite high. What is the extent of the difference? Well, you know, on average across all those cities, you're talking about public transport ridership about 37 to 40% in terms of people using uh, bus, tram, uh, train to get into work. In UK cities, it's much smaller. It's somewhere between 17 and 20%. And so what this tells us is that the goal that we should be having, and a lot of transport policy in recent years, understandably, has been about trying to return ridership back to pre-COVID levels. What this tells us, even pre-COVID, that, that position was not in a place where we want to be. And really the conversation should be moving on now from trying to hit a, a pre-COVID uh, uh, levels of, of ridership up to trying to hit Western European standards in terms of ridership. And that requires not a relatively a small recovery in ridership, but a doubling of ridership from where we were in you know, the, the 2010s uh, up to where the Western European, large Western European cities were at the same period. And if we were to do that, you know, rough estimates would mean that there would be around about a million more journeys just in these large cities, apologies, uh, and just in these large cities that, uh, that will be done by public transport uh, to get into work compared to where we are. So it's a huge shift. The size of the prize is very large, but other Western European cities show that this is totally feasible. You know, we haven't picked this doubling out of thin air other large urban areas do it, we should be trying to do that here, and that should be the goal of policy. So in order then to assess this about, the question is, well, what should we do about this? And so within the report, we try to put a bit of a framework in place to think about uh, what the different areas should be, and we come up with seven broad areas that we look at. We have this, what I think is a very nice chart to try and show sort of what the breakdown, or how we break it down, and have some logic around it and some framework around it. I'm not going to run through all of the chart, but the key thing is to focus on the, the bottom bit. So there are two broad buckets. We have non-financial interventions and financial interventions. And we, in that, we identify seven different policy areas that we should be thinking about if we are going to drive this ridership up. That was an awful pun. I didn't mean it. I'll try not to do things here, things like drive, etc. again. So across the bottom, we've got those uh, seven policies. First one, and the really, really important one, is around densification. Now, why is that important? Well, if you think about having, let's say, a thought experiment, you have a, a fantastic public transport system, let's say, in the Highlands, let's, let's say, underground system in the Highlands, so, so go crazy for a second, that would be fantastic, but it wouldn't really serve anybody, because nobody lives there. If you then sort of take that over to cities and think about, well, if you've got a, a transport system in place, but actually people are really spread out, using the car is much more convenient than using the bus or the tram or the, or the train. And the goal of policy has to be about trying to make the bus and the train the more, uh, the more attractive choice, that the car becomes less, less the, the easy choice to take, that you're going to make the positive choice of using car, uh, uh, bus and train. And to do that, density really underpins this. Because if you don't live near your bus stop, you're, not going, you're going to get in your car rather than going to the bus stop. When you actually haven't got that many customers near the bus stop, the, the, the good bus company is not going to serve that bus route with frequent reliable services because they can't turn a profit in terms of doing that. So urban form is really, really, really important in this. And um, there are a number of case studies that, that, um, that we look at in the report, but a really interesting one, which uh, John, you worked on uh, previously as well, um, is looking at Lille, where Lille decided that they were going to put a zone around their new stations, you know, where they have higher density codes, encourage that density to be built around the train stations, which then sort of create the market for people then to use uh, public transport. We should be doing the same thing here. UK cities outside of London just aren't dense enough, and we need to be changing the urban form if we want to be getting people onto public transport. So planning and transport together, sorry, yes, planning and transport together, really, really important. Number two, integration of existing networks. Uh, it seems to be a, a thing that is done across the world as well. Loads of examples are, are on this where you've got different modes of transport integrated, allows you to have single ticketing across all those different modes. You can change very easily uh, using those payment methods. And your New York, we pull out as an example of this, but there are other examples in the report too. This is, this is pretty common uh, outside of the UK, not so common within the UK, uh, and a key policy lesson. Um, third one is about improving and expanding networks. The number of ways of, of doing that, we look through different examples, but Singapore provides an interesting case study about how they control the, the bus system there in order to provide those broader, um, uh, those, those broader services, frequent services, so that you've got a better service there to encourage people uh, onto uh, public transport. Policy four, uh, trans, 
uh, public transport priority measures, a number of examples, even the UK of, of doing this. Uh, Edinburgh and Brighton have been places that have put things in place like bus lanes and bus gates to, uh, to speed up bus journeys relative to other modes of transport. And interestingly, I just looked at this uh, again yesterday, even Liverpool are going to bring back their bus lanes. And some of you may remember that in 2013 they scrapped quite a few of them and it was pretty controversial and yet they're now coming to, to bring that back in again and clearly there are uh, all sorts of things happening across the world as well. Um, and then five, uh, discounted ticketing. Now, this is an interesting policy area because it gets a lot of interest. You'll have heard about what <coughs> happened in Germany uh, during COVID where they had the, it was a nine euro ticket cap. They did a similar thing within Spain as well and it grabs headlines. And then here we've got the, the two pound bus cap uh, in place too. It's very interesting, it's flashy. It's like, oh, money off, we're going to cap fares. Isn't that brilliant? Our message here is that we have to be cautious about that sort of thing. Because if we cap fares and put less money into the system without making investments to improve the system, then you're not sustainably changing how the system works and you're actually creating a deficit rather than having long-term behavioural change. And there's an interesting um, a case that we pull out on the T-Verda uh, scheme that happened in, in Barcelona, which, um, which offered discounted ticketing through the form of actually a scrappage scheme. And they said, if you, um, if you trade in your old polluting car, we'll give you three years of free public transport uh, travel instead. And that's quite interesting, particularly in terms of what happened uh, in Uxbridge recently, etc. too, about how they used the messaging and, and the, the incentives that they gave in order to, to make that, that swap. And there's something, I think, uh, to uh, reflect on and learn from from a UK perspective at the very least in terms of that, that case study. All those uh, examples there, I think, are what we describe as being carrot examples. They are about trying to encourage people onto to public transport and, and make that system work better. But I don't think we can just do the carrot approach, as we see from around the world. We've got to think a bit about the, the stick approach as well. And particularly from a driving perspective, how do we get drivers to face more of the full cost that they place on society by driving? And so that gets us into the much more politically contentious areas of uh, and road pricing measures, again, take us back to Singapore. We, uh, Singapore is well known for its uh, road user charging uh, and very developed there compared to elsewhere in the world. Interesting thing to, to think about. And then finally, you know, other car ownership and parking measures. Um, and we pull out case studies from Japan where um, there are uh, quite large charges to, to use the space where you park your car. And indeed, even in Nottingham, where there's a workplace parking levy, the only place in the UK where, again, employers are charged for the parking spaces they provide, some of which is, is passed on to employees, all with the uh, intention to increase the cost of driving and, and, get the, and get drivers to bear the cost of driving. So then you're, trying, you're starting to shift the, the balance of, of costs and benefits between, um, between the two things. But for all the international case studies that we look at, which are great and they provide us with a lot of, a lot of good ideas um, and hopefully a lot of inspiration for policy makers about what we might do here, we mustn't forget that we've got a very good example of this very close to home in terms of how this is being done and actually shows that these types of things can be done in, in the UK and indeed actually some of this is just about policy and legislation change that we, uh, we need to bring in. And London has done all these things. So when we looked across all the case studies, um, there were a number of consistent themes that were coming out. We highlight case studies to illustrate one bit of policy, but usually they've got an integration of a number of different of these policies, because doing one on their own just won't work. You've got to do uh, a number of them. And, uh, and London is a, a good example of this. So we've got densification. London was dense already, but here's a picture I saw from, uh, from Google Street View, which shows you the development around uh, Tottenham Hill. Um, I don't live very far away from there, and the change around there has been pretty incredible in the last couple of years. Same in Stratford, when I was around there not so long ago, it's almost like a completely new place in terms of, of what is, is being built. And there's a similar thing in, in Wood Green going on at the moment as, as well. You know, building much greater densities, which, makes, which is easier to serve by public transport, um, and the public transport works as a better as a result. Integrated ticketing, you know, it's existed here so long now that you're probably thinking, what's that card that somebody's <laughs> holding? Do you remember those? Oyster cards, they were great, weren't they? And now obviously we've got contactless payments here, and yet elsewhere in the UK, you know, we're still, uh, still struggling there to catch up, mainly because of the, uh, the structure that's in place in, in terms of how public transport operates elsewhere in the UK. Do exist in some places, but it's been a hard fought battle in terms of trying to get that in place. We've got frequent services, so here's the, the 43, the excellent uh, 43 um, that goes up there to Barnet. You can see there, just when I went on the TfL journey track, I was able to, uh, to pull out uh, how frequent the, the services were. And you can see there, 4 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 24 minutes. 
actually quite a large gap there, 15 to 24 minutes. I wonder what was going on. But basically... Somebody we, from TFL will be on the case <laughs> as we speak. But you know you can get to the bus stop and there's going to be a, a bus running. Or you can go to the, the tube station and you know there's a tube running. But unless you were getting the Piccadilly line this morning, but you can't control fire alerts, even with all these fantastic uh, things in place. But the other interesting thing about that is, um, by having that, that control there, in terms of the, the um, franchise system within London, is that that data then can be used much more easily to then inform passengers about how quickly the services are running. And then you can use that data to understand how well the system is running, to show you where problems are, and then use that to guide investment in the way that, and track how many people are using the service as well. And the way it's much more difficult to do that uh, elsewhere in the country from a, from a, from a policy maker's perspective at the very uh, least. Transport priority measures, here's a, a, a picture. Uh, is that, uh, that's Moogate, I think, isn't it? I can't remember where I got that from now. Anyway, Centrewood. Where is it? Hoban, sorry. Oh, they were closer to where we are in that case. And thank you very much. I knew someone in the audience would know that. Uh, here's an example here of bus lanes in place, but you know, you don't have to go very far in London to be able to see uh, bus lanes uh, in action. Uh, we've got fare zones, which have been well established, which simplifies. Uh, uh, it simplifies costs and, and travel. You know that you go between zones is how much it costs. There's a daily cap in place, which is not the, the case in, in many other uh, places. Uh, and then also we've got the congestion charge, which was hugely controversial when it was first brought in, but nobody really seems to bat an eyelid uh, now. Interesting there in terms of context we're having, or conversation we're having in terms of UK policy currently about how you might implement that elsewhere or not. Now, a really important part of that congestion charging is that it raises money to then reinvest within the system. Now, bus franchising in London, or buses in London, run at a loss. And they're cross-subsidised by the tube and by things like the congestion charge. A big thing is if we are going to see a shift towards that, the, that approach elsewhere in the country, it will need to be cross-subsidised, and it therefore will mean that there will be need to be tough political choices taken around congestion charging or workplace parking levies or other forms of raising money locally. So this isn't just a free lunch where we'll just bring in a new system and everything will be fine. We do need to be thinking about how we're going to, to finance this, and that is a, a thorny thing to, to tackle. <laughs> and you know, the current politics around this in, in Uxbridge really show why that is controversial. So where does that then get us? What are the, the policy recommendations that we, that we come up with in the report where we've got then examples from around the world? So the first one, which hopefully will come as no su surprise, is that you know, densifying the, our larger cities, which are very much lower density than other Western European or Japanese or, or other cities elsewhere in the world, which we show in the report, is really, really important. And that means bringing transport and planning together so you're doing both at once rather than thinking about them um, separately, which is, is off not always, but is often what happens from a public sector perspective. Second one is about creating and empowering, uh, creating institutions that, where they don't exist and empowering the ones that are there to be giving TfL style powers uh, elsewhere in the country. London has had these now for at least two decades. Why are we not doing that elsewhere? Something for us to uh, uh, be trying to push on. Um, third one is to take up the bus franchising powers uh, that are in place where it makes sense to where there isn't a good commercial relationship there already, where the, the bus network is not working currently, it's not doing what we need it to do. And think about taking on those powers. Greater Manchester has just done it, Liverpool City Region is in the process of doing so, West Yorkshire is currently out for consultation on it, other places should consider that too. Um, raise revenue locally and navigate the, the politics of that around congestion charging or, or other things. And then finally, beware of discounted ticketing schemes in isolation. They make headlines, they sound great, but you've got to think about the short term being the long term in this and how that then ultimately leads to a system that functions where people do take the positive choice of using public transport over private transport. So that's all I have to say. Back over to you, Andrew. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. <laughs> OK, so can I just check that people at the back can hear me? Is that right? Okay, so we had some mics that our panellists may need to use, but uh, for the moment um, I'll, I'll use, I won't use one. So we're going to move to the panel session, we're going to get our three panellists up, we're going to hear from them reflections of what they've heard from their own perspectives, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. So when we get to the questions, just say who you are, actually ask a question, it's really important in the question and answer <laughs> session. Make your questions preferably short, and then we'll get through as many as we, um, we possibly can. So. Our three panellists are Vernon Everett, Commissioner for Transport for Greater Manchester. And former senior leader at TFL. Uh, we've got um, 
Emma Duncan, who is a columnist at the time the, the Times. <laughs> and our third panelist is Louis Rambo, who's the Group Sec Strategy and Transformation Director at Go Ahead Group. So these are our panelists. <laughs> We're going to hear from uh, from Vernon, then from Emma, then from uh, Louis, and then we'll we'll have a bit of a conversation. Think of the questions that you want to put to them. So. Um, Vernon, let's start with you. Uh, you are now in Greater Manchester. You were in London. What are you taking from London to, to Manchester? And just say a little bit about that that process. Well, I just think some of the some of the magic ingredients that Paul explained are the sorts of things that we uh, are taking to Greater Manchester. I have to say, it's not a perfect template, London, because there are very different conditions and different markets being served. But some of the things that make, has made London successful are, are being transferred and, and just to build on uh, I think your excellent report Andrew and Paul um, Central City has always produced really thoughtful stuff uh, some of the things I'll just add uh, to what you put up there devolution is a huge issue here the reason why London is in its position that it, it's in today is because of the creation of the mayoralty uh, and and that's, uh, that's relatively recent, actually. It was only the year 2000 when the first London mayor was appointed. But it gave that single point of political accountability for all of this stuff. Whereas in the past it was, you know, with that brass plate over here for buses, that brass plate over here for everything else. So what, what that enabled, and the, and the Greater London Act, uh, what that enabled the mayor to do is to brigade the economic strategy for London the spatial structures <coughs> for London, and then put it alongside it the transport one, and it just made it all coherent. So I, I, w I would put political accountability in your grid, actually. And the, the one other thing uh, that I thought was interesting is safety. Uh, making people feel safe and be safe on public transport and active travel, because it's not just about public transport, there's the, the active travel element to this as well is also uh, really, really important. And the whole point of what uh, we're doing in Manchester, and I think you, if, if someone was here representing West Yorkshire or South Yorkshire or the Liverpool City Region or Wales, everyone would say the same. This is all directed towards increasing the productivity of the regions. It's not just so that we can have nice yellow buses. It's so it enables everything else. Uh, getting people to work, getting people to new homes, enabling... Uh, investment to come in uh, to the regions. There's huge population growth outside London, parts of Great Manchester, some of the fastest growing uh, uh, parts of, uh, of the country and transport needs to be sustainable. Currently you have 60% of journeys that are either, uh, either being driven or uh, as, as passengers uh, and that's a, a huge levelling. We, we're aiming for 50-50 so all of this is going towards that, integrating the ticketing, joining up the modes um, and removing those barriers that prevent uh, people from, from, uh, from using public transport. So it's a huge enterprise, um, giving locally elected politicians more powers, as actually has happened relatively recently in Manchester and Birmingham with the trailblazer deals is an absolutely central part of delivering uh, a world that resembles London elsewhere in the country. Brilliant. I'll come to him in a second, but just say, just give us a, a, a quick update on, because one of the big things around transport that the Mayor has been vocal on for a very long time and is now actually implementing it because he has powers and the capabilities to do so is around bus franchising. Yeah. For those that are less familiar, it's just underway in, uh, in Manchester. So just give colleagues in the room just a quick update as to where you are and actually some pleasing and promising early outcomes. So we're doing it, bringing, uh, we're franchising the buses just as it's done here in London, doing it in three tranches. Our colleagues at Go North West uh, have got the big franchises in the first tranche, Wigan, Bolton, parts of Bury and Salford. In eight weeks, uh, we've put on 8% more passengers and we are ahead of revenue forecast for a, a by about 15%. And that's with, I think we would all agree, uh, there's lots of stuff that we need to do to improve those services and to drive up to uh, the targets that we've got for punctuality and kilometres operated and all the rest of it. But that, uh, you know, and we have a plan for, for improvement, so we're not complacent about that by any means.
but that combination of being coherent in the planning, capping the fares, uh, getting the customer information out there is plainly having, uh, plainly having effect, even though it's imperfect and there's a lot more we need to do to, to make it better. Brilliant. Well, we'll come back uh, on that and many other issues. Emma, <laughs> let's turn to you. I mean, you're one of the few, I, I would say, prominent journalists that actually quite a, <coughs> write quite a bit about buses and public ridership and all those kind of things. So I wonder, you know, what, what do we make of that? You know, in a sense, are, are the media sufficiently interested in the things that obviously everybody in the room deeply cares about uh, or not? And what, what do we draw from that? Well, I write, uh, I write a certain amount about um, transport because I, I'm, I, my, my brief is very wide. I don't think I've ever been given a brief, actually, except <laughs> write some stuff that people don't know. Um, and behind what I write, um, there is very often the issue of productivity, um, which is uh, particularly troubling in this country. In the West as a whole, um, it, it slowed significantly before the financial crisis. Um, and here it's pretty much flatlined. Um, and there are various odd things um, about productivity in Britain, but one of them is the second city problem. Um, so if you look around Europe, um, uh, second cities on average um, are more productive than the national average. Um, and in Britain they're 84% as productive as the national average. So you've got a really interesting question hanging around that. Um, so um, uh, I by no means a transport specialist, but, but sparked partly by a conversation with the Centre for Cities. Um, I did a piece um, uh, pegged on Manchester's uh, franchising a few months ago. Um, and the thing that really interested me about doing this actually was the, um, was the response I got. Um, I mean, there was sort of lots of interesting data that I dug up doing it. Um, but um, when, when I do a column, normally there's kind of, um, you know, one to 200 comments, um, <coughs> quite a lot of whom, uh, quite a lot of which say, um, this woman has no idea what she's talking about, <laughs> <laughs> um, or that's five minutes of my life I'll never get back. Um, um, I, I thought, I was sort of slightly nervous doing a piece about buses because you know, the reason most journalists don't write about buses is people think buses are boring. Um, and when you pitch um, a, a column to the op-ed editor, by and large, she says, come on, give us, you know, give us something a little sexier. Um, but uh, he said, all right, for the buses. Um, and I got about 400 comments um, for my buses piece. And um, when, when people comment, they get... Um, uh, others recommend them. So when you're looking down the, the comments, you see the most popular ones at the top. So I th and and they were really good comments right. actually. Pretty much all of them were really interesting, concerned comments. And I thought I'd just read you the top two. Um, so the most popular one was. Uh, a very important article, transport is such a crucial aspect of modern urban civilization. Britain remains in the dark ages, especially outside London. We have some of the biggest cities in the rich world without proper transport system. Even America does better on some measures. Um, buses are generally expensive and erratic. Um, alternatives don't exist for most of us. Um, even in big and prosperous cities like Bristol. They just opened their first new rail station over a century. They're quite astonishing and frankly pathetic. The lack, of, the lack of proper transport systems is a symptom of our total inability to conduct long-term strategic thinking and our total lack of vision. We're a nation stuck in the past arguing about parochial trivialities and why we can't do things rather than why we can and must. So that one got a hundred likes. And just um, before you go, if anybody in the room actually provided that, <laughs> <laughs> which there may be, there must be a reasonable chance that that is the case. Well done. <laughs> well done. Louis, you're, you're obviously a, you're an operator in this system. So give us the operator's view. You know, how do you think about some of the challenges, some of the issues? Does it affect the way that you then run the organization and the services that you, you're providing? Thank you. Um, I mean, I have to say that since I read, you know, the piece of paper of Emma, I started working for Go Ahead directly. 
<laughs> so you have a huge <laughs> impact on this business. Um, I mean, uh, this topic is very important for us, huh? uh, but I think not only for bus operators, because it's our, our daily bread, I would say, um, but for, for all citizens uh, in the country. I mean, I think fundamentally, there are, uh, you know, if we are interested in increasing ridership in public transport, it's for three main reasons. The first one is, clearly, it's been mentioned, it has social and economic benefits for our cities. Uh, you know, initially, if we have public transport, it's for the people who cannot afford having private transport needs. And so this is definitely a, a big social impact on our societies. The second topic is, clearly, it has a urban objective. You know, uh, the bigger cities we have, uh, the more congested it is, and it's a big problem. And if we want to live in our cities in a, in a good way, we need to have uh, mass transport systems that, you know, take out all the cars from the cities even if it's uh, you know, electric cars or autonomous cars. And I think uh, more recently, public transport is becoming more and more important to address uh, the environmental challenge we have. Uh, just if you look at our CO2 emissions in, the in this country, 30% uh, of the emissions are made by mobility in general, and 20% only by passenger mobility. And why that? It's because 90% of the emissions come from cars. So removing cars <coughs> from the system clearly is one of our biggest targets. And just moving from cars to, to buses, you reduce by 60 to 75% your CO2 emissions. And even more, if you move to rail, you're moving by 85 to 90% of CO2 emissions. So this is clearly a great impact on our society, on our communities, and this is why we are interested in, in that. So I hope that if uh, this panel, you will all work in transport. <laughs> Very good. And obviously you operate, you know, the go-ahead operates across Europe, in, you know, in lots of different markets, lots of different mm. countries, lots of different cities. You know, we've talked a little bit about how you, the UK cities compare to, mm. uh, to European uh, cities on a, on a range of metrics. How do you, how do you think about that as, a, as an operator? How, how do you, what would be the big distinctions or differentiations would you draw from what you see in Europe, for example, and what you see here. So we are present in six countries. Uh, so the UK, we are in Sweden, uh, we are uh, in, uh, in uh, Singapore, we are in Australia, uh, and let me miss one, Germany. Um, so clearly, uh, um, we, we, ca we can see different examples. <coughs> All the, the, the seven policies that have been mentioned here are, are part of, of you know, our experience. Uh, one thing that for me, um, I mean, two things I think that are very important. Um, the first one, I mean, if you take a step back, uh, if people are using transport, it's for five reasons, public transport. The first one, it's been mentioned, it needs to be close to your house and to your job. Uh, otherwise, there is no point of using public transport. <coughs> Secondly, you, it needs to be um, uh, convenient, so to have frequent services. If it's not frequent, if you need to wait like 20 minutes, it's much too long. It needs to be reliable, uh, and so this is our job uh, as uh, operators. Um, it needs to be cheap, <coughs> because if it's more expensive than your car, come on, there is no point to take it. And finally, and it is very, very important, and potentially it's a bit missing, is it needs to be fast. If it takes more time uh, to go to your job by using a bus uh, rather than <coughs> using your car, you will not do it. I mean, as long as you love, you know, environment and reducing your CO2 emissions, you will not do it. And speed is a big, big part of what we are doing. And that's why, as part uh, in the different countries where we are, Having implementing measures to, to regulate the speed of cars versus buses, having priority measures for, for buses and measures that can reduce the, 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 the speed of cars is very, very important. Yeah, great point. Werner, come in on, on, on that, because I think in a sense everybody agrees we need to improve the public transport system, frequency, reliability, cost, uh, coverage, etc. But we're also very clear, and you're very clear, that you have to think about how the system interrelates with and interacts with, let's say, the, the car. And, you know, you have to be realist about the stick and the carrot approach. You, uh, and you just have to get there. Now, l l you did that in London. You can, you know, that was one of the core elements to it, improving the system, but also, you know, crudely making car travel, at, you know, at the margins much, you know, a bit more difficult. Just say a little bit about that, and then how does that then, how do you take that into a place like Greater Manchester? Where are you on that? <coughs> well, I think, it is, it is. So let, let's take a step back to 2003 when the congestion charge was introduced 
here in London, and what the mayor was able to do was put a load of money into the bus network uh, in parallel to introducing road user charging. So, uh, you, you know, he recognised there needed to be both carrot and stick. And the, and the already highly developed public transport network in London did give people um, an alternative. Uh, so it's just not like that outside London. It just isn't. The level of public transport provision and active travel simply is not there. Uh, and, and part of it, I think, comes to funding models as well, the reason why it isn't there is it's one of the things, mm. sorry, I'll, so, so in, in answer to your question, yeah. I think outside of London, you must absolutely improve public transport and active travel provision to give people a decent alternative before you start talking about sticks. But otherwise, you won't win the day anyway, um, po um, <coughs> politically, uh, and um, I, I just think it's, it, it's, it's pretty obvious. However, there are a whole bunch of things that uh, we are doing from an infrastructure uh, investment perspective. Uh, we're investing in zero emission buses to get to clean up the air, air, air quality. We are introducing dedicated bus lanes and all of the conventional things that you would seek to do, looking at pinch point junctions and all that sort of stuff. So we're getting on with all of that. And I think you have to do, you have to both improve public transport, do those infrastructure interventions, get the affordability right, get journey time reliability right. I think speed is important, but almost even more important than that is reliability of your journey time. <coughs> if you know it's going to take 35 minutes every day, you plan, don't you? Uh, and it, but if it takes you 21 day and an hour after next, it's no use. Great. I'll come so, yeah. so, anyway. No, no, it's a very good. I'll come to you in a second. One more question to you, Emma. Just, just come back on this, the thought you sort of finished with where you know, the the level of political interest, the level of public interest, how both of those things kind of feed off and feed into each other, and what does that mean? You know, if we're trying to make some quite significant changes to the way that our cities work, but also their public transport systems work, how do we both garner the interest of the politicians of the day and the public of the day? You know, you're in that sort of space. That's that's partly what you're doing with your with your writing. So, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interestingly tricky area in the sense that um, when transport becomes political, mm -hmm. painfully political, um, it's usually about cars. Um, it's usually something to do with taxation and cars. Um, yeah, and we saw that with... Um, uh, fuel prices, uh, with the gilets jaunes in France, um, we saw that um, in Uxbridge. And so I think the politicians are uh, see the downsides of messing with transport um, more than they see the upsides. Um, but what that makes me realise is that in Uxbridge, um, because Axbridge is reasonably well provided on the public transport front, um, all that was apparent <coughs> with the extension um, of the, um, uh, the ULES was the downside. And maybe outside London um, that uh, you can present a package of road pricing and public transport <coughs> improvements um, in such a way that people are sharply aware of what they're going to get out <coughs> yeah, of it rather yeah. than what they're going to be ta what's yeah. going to be taken away from it. I mean, <coughs> my, my sense at the moment is that um, nobody particularly wants to touch this stuff, um, but I, I wonder whether Labour isn't missing a trick on this. I mean, I think that... Um, the, the, so, so growth is the most important. I mean, Starman's made it very clear. Yeah. Growth is it. Yeah. That you're not going to get improved public services without growth. Mm -hmm. And um, he, so he's majoring on the planning stuff, which I think is absolutely great. But I would have thought that this is an area that he could, uh, he could also make a certain amount of mileage on. 
um, uh, excusing the pun. Very good. With, effortless, um, that was. Effortless. <laughs> <laughs> as something that involves um, both growth and welfare. Okay, I agree. I think buses are uh, the most underpriced uh, intervention that we could make uh, in the run-up, and I never understand why the political parties <coughs> don't make much more of it, because I there's, think it there's does... A, there's another column. ...cut through, I, and cuts through, <laughs> definitely uh, across the <coughs> spectrum. And Go on. If I might, just, yeah. just one thing to build on what Emma was just saying. The other thing not to forget is a lot of people don't own a car. Uh, 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 nearly 30% of people in Greater Manchester don't know those households don't have access to a car. So you're going to have to invest in public transport anyway. It's not an either or for those people. They're not travelling now. Yeah. They're not applying for jobs over the other side of the city. Yeah. I know. So it's yeah. important to it's a great point. that in mind. I think we did, when we did some work on the Glasgow transport system a couple of weeks ago, I think that number is about 41 <coughs> in Glasgow that don't own a car and it's not evenly distributed across the income distribution as you can imagine the people that are not owning uh, those cars and therefore are much more reliant on public transport being there for them to get them uh, to where they need to get to great okay we're going to take some questions now Louis how do we, how do we get the people and the public and everyone else to love buses as well as to <laughs> suffer them and ride in them what, what's your thought what what works um Go to the head and you will understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think uh, we mentioned people, I mean, some people will love buses. I mean, some of us might be geek, uh, geeks of buses, but I'm not requesting everyone to, to love buses. However, people we, will have to, to use buses for all the reasons we mentioned, and we, we have to, pro pro to provide them a service uh, which basically can connect them to the job, can help them uh, to reduce their emissions, etc. Et so, at, at the end, for me, it's not so much about love. Is we need public transport, and we need to have much more people uh, on board. I think to come back on, on the on two topics. One, the question of uh, of the local accountability. Um, clearly, I mean, uh, so I come from France. You might have heard. <laughs> uh, um, in France, there is much more local accountability for buses, <coughs> uh, I mean for buses, for transport in each mm -hmm. city. And the result of that is, uh, you know, it's a clear political, basically, um, mean to win elections because you can have power, you can raise money, and you can do things, basically, for, for transport. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what is difficult, I think, for, for some local authorities in the UK is they don't have the power and they don't have the money. So they cannot do things, you know, they can do great speeches, but that's it. So there is a clear, clear point here, I think, and a very valid point. And to come back to a point about, you know, um, politically it's difficult to, 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 to talk about transport. Y yes, it's right. Uh, however, you have some counter examples. In Paris, where I'm from, you know, the mayor of Paris clearly has had a very strong pro public transport po politics and anti car, and she has been reelected two times already. And based on, on this mandate specifically. So you can win on, with, with great ambition in transport. Brilliant. Emma, come in on. So either. I mean, pick up the qu questions around how do we make uh, people fall in love with our buses, but also this relationship between walking, active travel, and uh, and the public transport. And then there's a question about polit politics and accountability. But I mean, may maybe the the buses and the love. You talked a little bit about that. But. Um, sorry, I just turned into being a journalist. I was making notes from what everybody else was. Saying. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> On, uh, yes, no, I'm an economist too, so I don't do love. Um, but <laughs> um, on, <coughs> on the politics, um, I mean, I think Manchester is proving to be a really interesting example. Um, and I think it's getting a bit of attention um, because people know what's happening there. Um, and I mean, not just in uh, not just in public transport, but the extent of devolution in yeah. Manchester and the use that Manchester yeah. has made of devolution in a number of ways. Um, and I think that, um, and I'm going to come to Manchester and write about this broadly. Um, but I think uh, consciousness of that, of the fact that Manchester is beginning to work better than anywhere outside London. Um, is filtering through the country and back to London and informing the debate 
not just about devolution, mm. but about transport. Mm. So I think if we're going to have wider change through the country, it will come from Manchester. Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, Vernon, so um, you started by saying it's all about political leadership and accountability. It's not only about that, but that's where you start. You made the point about London having a mayor for 20 odd years. But So come on to that, but also just say, yeah. say a little bit about how the interactions between public and active, because we've talked about public and private but you know there's an increasing element around the active question uh, and I think if I may as well can I just pick up your you point about you love because um, I, I, I think marketing the bus network is really important and you, you can you can connect the journey with what people feel and, and, <coughs> and want to do with their lives so I think you, alongside getting the buses right getting them frequent and all the rest of it you have to market it. London was very good at that, uh, and had foodie lines and all, you know, and put labels around different lines and things like that. So I, I think marketing is really, really important. Um, <clears throat> I, I think one of the key things that's recognised outside London now is the symbiotic relationship between the highways network and public transport. People think about a railway network and a bus network. They don't necessarily think about highways network. So what I think we're all learning is, is you've got to get all of those pieces right, and that's when you get active travel. You cannot do anything other than plan strategically for active travel facilities when you start taking that whole system view uh, of, of the world. And, you, and we're never going to hit our, our decarbonisation targets and things like that unless uh, we get more people uh, uh, using active travel. And the final question was about a uh, single guiding mind for rail. I cannot wait. Honestly, I cannot wait. I'm a great supporter of GBRTT and the team there. They're working very well with us. Um, we, we are going to get um, one of the first pilots of integrated ticketing on the railways in 2025, uh, on, only about 20 years after it was introduced in London, but you know, one miracle at a time, <laughs> uh, 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 but no. My serious point is, I don't. I don't mean that to be a flippant comment. It's hard yards for, for yeah. them as well, yeah. but we cannot wait for a single guy in mind and have one conversation through a regional lens about what the railway can do for productivity and social inclusion in Greater Manchester. Can't wait. Brilliant. Okay, let's take let's take a couple more. And maybe Louis, why didn't you kick us off with? Do you want to? Can you say anything about? Buses in rural, you know, how do we make bus systems or transport systems work by definition where population is, is more sparse? I, mean, I think those three questions are completely related. Um, to, 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 um, we, we need definitely to have more people in public transport because they need and it's good for the environment. But at the moment, you know, we are adjusting <coughs> supply to demand. In, in some villages, you have few people. I mean, there is no point to, at the moment to have a profitable bus lane. And this is where, you know, the, the public authorities have to play their role and to play what they are made for. So there is no, no magic recipe. At the end, it's about money somehow. <coughs> we, ca we can discuss the technical elements, if it's better to have a DRT system, a fixed line, a cab, whatever. But uh, it's about money. And, uh, and so if it's about money, we come back to a question about uh, you know, uh, who, who is responsible and, ha and how to, 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 to fund it. And the tax action of property could be a way to do it clearly. Uh, in Paris, for example, at the moment, they are building a great metro network on top of the one which is existing. And one way to financing has been to create <coughs> a special tax for all the housing near the stations. Because clearly, they are going to benefit a lot uh, in terms of value for their property from being connected directly to a magnificent public network. And this is things we need to think about. So it's not, you know, a magic recipe. We need to think specifically for each case. But this is all those three questions are completely related. And my deep conviction is to address all the changes we have, social changes, environmental changes, etc. We need to increase much more the supply of public transport everywhere, uh, in, in everywhere, everywhere, uh, at night, uh, in small villages. Otherwise, people will not use public transport. Brilliant. Brilliant. Come in on, on this. I know this is you know one of your key areas that you you know you think <coughs> a lot and have done a lot on. You know the reflections on how we fund and finance the system, but, but also, I, I guess, your thought on, we mustn't get ourselves into this position where we think that once they're operational, that particularly buses, 
you know, they don't cover the costs of running those buses in many instances. And we have to think about them as part of a transport system more generally, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just returning to one of Emma's points about the difference between second cities uh, in, in the UK relative to in Europe, the, one of the biggest differentiating points is the funding model. I mean, much of the funding for public transport in continental Europe and in the US comes directly either from the federal, state, or from local tax raising. Uh, and local politicians have the powers to do that. That's not the case here. Um, we are, um, my mayor um, has raised money uh, locally in Greater Manchester through uh, his precept and things like that, but it's not of, of, of a similar scale. So I, I do think we have to look at the funding model because you get the results you get on that chart that Paul put up for first time round because of the way in which they, things are funded. And that's both from a capital perspective and from a revenue perspective as well. I think land value capture definitely plays a part. You do have to recognise though that the tax base for that is different across the UK. <coughs> Crossrail was sort of, what was it, a, a third borrowing, a third uh, business and a third, uh, I think, government. <coughs> uh, something of that order. And, and now post HS2, <coughs> What needs to happen at Euston has to be public, uh, has to be privately financed as well. So there's, I think, those your your questions are now in play to see whether or not they can bring about uh, those those sorts of changes. Um, but I think the funding model is absolutely fundamental. Part of it is is those special measures, but part of it is just recognising what public transport and active travel delivers elsewhere. Mm. It rarely falls to the balance sheet of the transport of the value rarely falls to the balance sheet of the transport operator. It falls to everywhere else in the local economy. And we've sort of lost connection uh, with that through understandable things like COVID where the Treasury are just looking at the checks they're writing for carrying fresh air. But we must reconnect that because otherwise we're not going to get the improvements that this report suggests. Excellent. Uh, thank you to Go Ahead uh, for working with us on the on the event and the, the research, very much uh, appreciate it. I hope you found that useful. Please take away the report, have a look at it, have a read of it. You can look at it online. We've done a bunch of other transport related uh, projects recently looking at different places across the country, Scotland and uh, Wales, which look at some of these issues in a bit more detail in particular uh, places as well. But uh, please join with me to thank my panelists in the usual way.